them, astronomers have found clues that suggest some may well have planets. The evidence forms part of a theory which describes how the universe and our solar system came into being. The further you go back in time in the universe, uh, the further we get away from uh, the physics of every day. And the most extreme example is when you go right back to what people think of as the beginning. Science cannot say what there was before the universe began, only that there was nothing. No space, no time. And without time, words like before and after lose their meaning. Time and space began with a big bang, but the early universe was nothing like what we know today. For hundreds of thousands of years, the temperature was so high that even atoms could not exist. The particles that would go on to make them seethed in a fiery state called a plasma. All the matter in the universe began an explosion outwards that continues to this day. Even now, space itself is still stretching. The Big Bang is the, so probably the most extreme example of things that, or the many things in astrophysics that I don't understand. You know, people seem to think you know, you're in some eminent position in astronomy, therefore you know everything about astronomy, but far from it. It's uh, impossible for me to grasp uh, this uh, sudden moment when, uh, following nothing, at which uh, all of a sudden there was this intensely dense, intensely hot point expanding rapidly outwards. From that point onwards, I can sort of grasp some of what is alleged to have happened, but um, what it, it means in terms of our concepts of space and time, uh, I simply don't know. Eventually, the universe cooled down to a few thousand Celsius. Atoms began to form, and virtually all the universe existed as a gas, hydrogen. But the Big Bang was uneven, and in places, gravity began pulling the gas together. Over the next billion years, so much hydrogen gathered in some regions that conditions were right for a nuclear reaction and the first stars began to shine. However strange astronomers' theories may sound, they are based on real observations. I think the, there's a misconception that science is trying to discover the truth, and I, personally I don't think there is such a thing as the truth in the realms of science. Science is a way of describing the universe rather than explaining it. It's a description which we try to make as simple as possible as we move on of how things happen. You stick your neck out, you say, my theory is this, and uh, you make predictions from it, and if those predictions are wrong, then you have to give up. Testing theories needs evidence from stars and galaxies of all ages. Luckily, the fixed speed of light makes that easy. Light travelling from objects near to us gets here sooner than light travelling from objects in the distance. A snapshot of the sky shows stars close to us when the light left them, maybe only 10 years ago. But in the same picture, very distant galaxies show up as they were when the light left them, millions of years ago. So a single image like this tells a story that stretches way back across time. The first giant stars only lasted a few million years before they exploded, seeding space with dust. This real picture shows the Eagle Nebula. It's a gigantic cloud of cosmic dust. It is lit from behind by the light from hot stars. In the dark, bubbly clouds, astronomers believe that stars and planetary systems are being born. Our solar system would fit in the tip of this dark finger. Indeed, it formed in a place very like this. Over billions of years, gravity pulled the dust together in a spinning disk around the early sun. Lighter material spun off to the edge and went on to form the giant gassy planets. Nearer the centre, the rocky worlds like Earth took shape. Because it formed by recycling the ashes of earlier stars, everything in the solar system is second-hand. Our sun, our Earth, 
even our own bodies, are made from the dust of dying stars. It's astonishing. Isn't it? Whenever I say that, I find myself disbelieving it. I mean, it's, it seems more fantastic than many of the more extreme religious belief systems uh, that are around. But the only thing that, that makes it a little bit more palatable and comprehensible as a, as a plausible theory is, is the fact that the universe is so old. I mean, this stuff has a billion years to spread out. Mountains get worn down by winds and water in, in, a, in a million years, so given time, it's amazing the things that can happen. In time, like all stars, our sun will also run out of nuclear fuel. It will swell up and engulf the inner planets, possibly including Earth. More massive stars explode to be recycled once again, but our star will end its life as a tiny dark ball of ash. If human life still exists, then will be the time for us to become the aliens and move on to other worlds. I think it is likely that with all the stars in the universe, that around one of them, there must be a planet that has conditions that are suitable for life. Whether or not they are close enough for us to ever meet, who knows? Personally, I would be astonished if there weren't life, intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. It is puzzling that uh, if life is common, why is it not easier to find? You might have thought that the first radio telescopes to look for signals from other stars would immediately have found them, and yet we haven't. So it's a pretty sobering thought, but the first episode of Coronation Street, the signals from that have gone out to a distance such that thousands of stars could have received them if they were intelligent people. Yeah. But maybe that's why they haven't bothered to come and look, because the you know, Coronation Street was too much for them, I, I don't know. To me, the whole thing was not um, frightening in any way. Um, I know now that people do think that UFOs are frightening, but my experience wasn't in any way at all. I've always thought of it as a, as a very friendly experience. Gardens, London. I work at Kew in one of the departments that has a collection of six million of specimens. Together they work like if it were a library, for instead of a book, we have dry plants from the tropics in Malaysia, can be from the desert in Arizona, or like this one which I got recently from Bolivia. For over 200 years, scientists here have been collecting and studying plants. The challenge is to find, name and preserve species before they become extinct. Plant habitats are being destroyed all around the world, especially the rainforests. This is the closest Britain gets to a rainforest. Scientists at Kew have built a living laboratory to study how many different plant species come together to create such a special environment. There are many types of rainforest. Some of them have very tall trees, up to 70 meters tall. This one is a particular 
tree, which is a medium size, can reach about 40 meters height in normal conditions. This is a special one because 11 years ago, I brought it from Mexico in a form of a little tiny seed. Now we are above 25 meters above the ground that we were before, and we have reached one of the layers of the canopy in the rainforest. Here is really where the action for the plant begins, where the photosynthesis will take place, where the food for itself is going to be produced, and in addition, released oxygen, which is important for all the living organisms in the earth. Photosynthesis is something no animal can do. Carbon dioxide from the air seeps into the leaves through pores, called stomata. It reaches tiny granules, chloroplasts, that contain a green chemical, chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the key to photosynthesis. It uses energy from sunlight to bond the carbon dioxide to the hydrogen in water brought up from the roots. The result is carbohydrates, sugars and starches that the plant can use to grow. But photosynthesis also produces oxygen. Every day, each person on the planet needs to absorb several hundred balloon volumes of pure oxygen from the air. And we each produce several hundred balloon volumes of carbon dioxide. So the Earth's atmosphere is in a constant balance. Plants recycle our carbon dioxide and we recycle their waste oxygen. Plants, humans and animals across the planet need each other. Dave Shaw is a biologist. For the last five years, he's been studying the rainforest of eastern Ecuador with the help of his friend, Pepe Tapia. Dave Shaw and uh, me, we became friends when he was in my shop. And uh, we were talking about uh, some uh, big problems that we have. And he didn't believe me. So uh, he said, next year I will be back and you can take me and I can see with my own eyes. This Ecuadorian rainforest is really, really uh, spatial and because uh, this, is, uh, this is the paradise, this is really beautiful. Photosynthesis supports every kind of life in the rainforest. A huge range of insects and animals depend directly or indirectly on plants for food. The range of species here is greater than anywhere else on Earth. So many species that some haven't even been named yet. The problem is, the trees on which they depend are being cut down. The forest floor here is covered in dead leaves and branches. All things that fall from the tops of the trees, but you can see how they all rot and break down. And it's the goodness from this that really feeds the rainforest. The soil itself isn't very good. It's the food, the goodness, the nutrients in this that the trees need to survive, which is why when they cut the trees down, everything else dies because there's no food left for them. You can see on the trunk that some scientists have actually labeled, marked the tree here. Because this is a reserve, they're trying to identify all the different plants and animals to keep a record of them. Otherwise, it's difficult to protect things if you don't know their names and how many there are. Pepe, what's it called? It's good. Rainforest sweet, like liquid. This is the problem. An oil pipeline has just been laid through the rainforest. At the moment, it's just a pipeline. But oil companies also plan to build roads and create traffic. That could destroy the homeland of native people like the Warani tribe. 
Uh, the situation in uh, this uh, Warani people is uh, is hard for them because uh, they live uh, deep in the forest. They are the most beautiful tribe. Still now they live like a uh, hundred years ago. These people, they are really peaceful. They are always uh, smiling. They are always laughing. Uh, they, they are free. Uh, for Warani, this is uh, really important because uh, this is their house. And uh, if they need uh, something to eat, they just go on the forest and they just eat. So if uh, somebody goes and destroys, chop down trees, uh, they won't get food anymore. The Warani are not alone. Around the world, native people want to keep their traditional way of life. But they also need cash to buy things like medicines. It's a dilemma. Here in the country, Ecuador, we need uh, money from Europe, America, and multinational companies. They come into the rainforest and they are uh, allowed to come and uh, to get uh, oil, to get timber. I think this is, uh, it, this is bad because uh, uh, the rainforest is getting destroyed really, really fast. These are prints of a, a lemur that's going to be made extinct if the mine goes ahead. Thanks, we'll get the taxi now. Bye. Friends of the Earth campaigns to preserve the world's rainforests. RTZ, the world's biggest mining company, is planning to mine a rainforest in Africa. And we're going along to the annual general business meeting to try and persuade them not to go ahead with this project. This protest is being held in London. It's about a country on the other side of the world. Even so, Friends of the Earth argues that mining in the rainforest will be bad for the whole planet. Many countries desperately want to develop their own natural resources and look for the help of a responsible international group like us to help us. And we have a whole queue of them coming to us. And why do they do that? It's because they too want the benefits of economic development. They want the taxation and royalty income we can bring to them when they're often very hard pressed to make basic social provision. They want the infrastructure, they want the skills, they want the technology, they want the expertise that we can bring. And I must say, I think it's very wrong of those in the West uh, who want to dwell in some green utopian fantasy that we will have a complex, elaborate society, but other people are to be denied this. I think that's a wrong attitude. The world's rainforests are crucial to the future of our planet. They supply the very oxygen that we breathe and are homes to thousands of species of plants and animals found nowhere else. And it could be of great benefit to us. For example, extracts from plants found in rainforests supply the cure to many terrible diseases such as leukemia. People forget that the product of mining is basic to our whole way of life, not just in the West, not just for the cars, the planes, the refrigerators, but in the developing world for the copper piping that means clean water, for the woks and saucepans that people cook in, for the bicycles that people move around in. So it's not that you haven't got to have mining. Of course we've got to have mining. The only issue is whether it's responsible mining. We too uh, um, want to see that areas of great natural beauty and special ecology are protected. But if the government gives permission for a well-managed mine to go ahead, it's actually far less destructive than logging, which can occupy an enormous area, cattle ranching, which can lead to ecological devastation. So I don't feel any reason to be defensive about the impact of a well-managed mine, which may occupy an area no greater than that of a, an industrial estate on the edge of an English town. AM. At one of Britain's biggest tomato nurseries, it's time for breakfast. Over the next hour, these plants will suck up most of the 50,000 litres of water they will need for photosynthesis today. It's pumped to their roots.
This is photosynthesis running at full speed. In nature, the rate of photosynthesis is always limited by a shortage of light, water or carbon dioxide or because the plants are at the wrong temperature. But here, everything's controlled to boost plant growth. Since they started, they've managed to push the plants to yield eight times the crop they would grow in a field. Pat Smith is the production supervisor. She leads a team of eight full-time tomato pickers. Well, basically, we give them everything that they need to grow. All the light that they want from the high greenhouses, heat from pipes on the ground and carbon dioxide from the tubes which shoots out a little pinpricks at the side and all they've got to do is grow. The plants have everything except soil. This is a hydroponic nursery and the roots grow directly in running water. Here is living proof that plants can grow out of thin air. Last year, these plants used photosynthesis to turn carbon dioxide and water into 800 tonnes of tomatoes. The roots draw in water through a thin membrane layer. It's sucked up in tubes called xylem, which are made from cylindrical cells stacked end to end. Water reaches the leaves, it's used for more than photosynthesis. Another process, transpiration, keeps the plants cool. The cooling happens through evaporation. Liquid water turning into vapor takes heat away as it passes out through the stomata. The greenhouses are controlled by a computer system. On hot sunny days, the windows open automatically. Dark winter evenings can be brightened up for extra growing time with special lighting. But it's not all high tech. In among the plants are mini beehives. The bees pollinate the tomato flowers. Other helpful insects keep down pests that could destroy the crop, so there's no need to use insecticide. Hydroponic nurseries need only a small quantity of chemicals. Because the plants aren't grown in soil, they still need all trace elements and the acid which they would get out of the soil. So these are the feed tanks. Those have got the trace elements in. And when it's running low, the probe in the tank tells the computer and the pump starts working and it comes down the line along here. And when it reaches the necessary level, it stops pumping. They've built as much recycling into the nursery as they can. Even the waste gas from the heating system is used to provide carbon dioxide for the growing process. It all uses a lot of energy, but growing tomatoes like this guarantees consumers a quality product all year round. From space, it's clear just how much the world's living systems are interlinked and human spaceflight has shown how difficult it is for us to survive away from Earth. Until now, astronauts have had to take all their oxygen with them. But at NASA's Johnson Space Center, they're testing a new idea that could make long space journeys possible. A British scientist volunteered to be locked for two weeks in an airtight chamber. I'm in an airlock which is attached to a chamber full of, uh, full of wheat which is growing uh, using artificial lighting in hydroponic uh, solution. They're providing my oxygen and they're taking up my carbon dioxide, both in the morning when I'm, when I'm working normally, when I'm exercising in the afternoon and when I'm asleep, the plants take up that carbon dioxide and produce oxygen for me through photosynthesis. When I walk into the plant growth chamber, it's like a breath of fresh air really, apart from the fact that it's an increase in volume. Um, it also makes you feel a little bit like you're outside. It, uh, it smells very different. It's like walking into a greenhouse almost. Nigel was kept alive by 22,000 wheat seedlings. They were grown in an area of 10 square meters using the same technology that tomato nurseries use on Earth. We can get to a full harvest in about 90 days, in other words, from grain to seed. The reason I'm wearing glasses is we've got uh, 
high pressure sodium lamps in here which put out the equivalent of about one sun so it's pretty bright the uh, the other thing is I'm wearing hearing protection in my right ear and the comm on my left because we've got two large blowers sitting right down here uh, which put out quite a lot of noise um, of course the, the the door going into the airlock is, is padded pretty heavily so I don't hear that noise in the airlock itself the experiment worked Nigel was the first person to experience what life on a plant-powered space mission could be like. Life has been very pleasant here. Um, it's really a home away from home. The only thing I can't do is walk out the door. The plants have performed uh, wonderfully so far. They react very quickly to me being here and to changes in my uh, metabolic output. For example, if I sit on the, uh, the bicycle and start uh, exercising for 30 minutes and I uh, tend to put out a lot more carbon dioxide, the plants react very, very rapidly to that. So it's, it's almost as if you, they know I'm here. Technology has brought us a long way. But until a machine can reproduce photosynthesis, we will depend on plants to keep the Earth alive.